Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, we are talking to Mallory Atkinson, a CPSM lead co-founder and managing partner at Shear Structural about how engineers can find flexibility in structural engineering and discuss some of the things company owners can do to retain staff at their firms. I'm your co-host, Matt Cardle. And I'm your co-host, Kara Green. Now let's jump into our conversation of the week with Mallory. This episode of the Structural Engineering Channel is brought to you by Collier's Engineering and Design. Collier's Engineering and Design is a multidisciplinary engineering firm with over 1,800 employees in 63 offices nationwide and growing fast. Collier's Engineering and Design maintains an internal culture that is nurtured through the promotion of integrity, collaboration, and socialization. Their employees enjoy hybrid work environments, continuous career advancement, health and wellness offerings, and programs and projects that have a positive impact on society. Collier's Engineering and Design stays on the cutting edge of technology and their entrepreneurial approach to expansion provides personal and professional development opportunities across the firm. Leadership's dedication to the well-being of their employees and their families is demonstrated throughout the wide range of benefits and programs available to them. For more information, visit the career page on their website at colliersengineering.com. Mallory, first, thank you for joining us on the show. In your own words, could you please tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself, the firm you work for, and how you ended up incorporating a startup mentality into running a structural engineering firm? Sure. Thank you. And thank you guys so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, I would first like to say I'm not a structural engineer. So fair warning, I'm not a structural engineer. I do own a structural engineering company, but I'm not a structural engineer. I actually started my career um, at Georgia Tech, getting a degree in construction management and worked for a general contractor, being a site superintendent and a project manager for a really small company. Realized I loved the built environment, but I did not love being in the field each and every day. Um, and so when I graduated, I went to go work for a multidisciplinary engineering firm in marketing and business development. And so that's where I fell in love with talking about the work that we do every day in the built environment and the spaces and, and you know, being a part of the spaces and places that people get to interact with each and every day. And got my MBA and thought I was kind of moving up towards the ownership route. And then I hit a ceiling because I'm not technical. So in, in my view and what I could see in the marketplace was definitely really hard for me being non-technical to go any further. And so I left the industry and I went to go work for a tech startup and doing like totally something totally different. We were creating a mobile market research app and in that space, I got to see like the fast paced startup culture and how exciting that world was. And we were only building a market research app. Like that's what we were doing. And I was like, well, you know, when I was working in the, in the built environment, like in the engineering, like we were like building really cool buildings and roads and bridges and parks. And, you know, why is nobody excited about this work? And people are really excited about technology and technology is really cool. But again, the spaces and places that people interact with each and every day is way cooler in my opinion. So um, like all good startups, we ran out of money. And so I took that opportunity <laughs> to reevaluate. And I was like, look, I really, like I have this entrepreneurial spirit. It's why I went to go work for a tech startup. I wanted to have equity in something. So I wanted to just be a part of something and make those, be able to make those decisions at that level. And I thought I had something really valuable to offer. So I had reached out to a couple of my contacts in the industry and found one that I had worked with previously. And so we started talking and um, who's now my current business partner. And so we started talking about that. And the more we just kind of started meeting about it, started talking about what this business could look like. She's obviously a structural engineer. And especially in the industry, there are very few female owned structural engineering companies. And so that in itself was, you know, interesting and um, a lot of opportunity there. And we brought in our third business partner. And in 2017, after six months of talking, we launched Sheer Structural and just about to hit our five-year anniversary. And we have 13 full-time people, another four contract staff. And um, it's been a really fun ride. 
Yeah, that's really interesting, uh, especially the tech startup background, because those are they're, they're pretty much split. You don't have people in both industries. <laughs> and like no, you were, you, yeah, yeah. I feel like you would have a really spicy take on, you know, <laughs> going from construction management and in like what I would consider a very like uh, black and white type of field to something that's like very innovative and you know fast paced, as you mentioned, and moving that in back into a very, you know. I wouldn't call construction or construction management slow per se. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I did start in construction in Alabama, <laughs> which is a slower mm. pace for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what was what's so interesting, you know, being in the tech startup and uh, literally we were thinking in like minutes, you're just like, how do we, you know, and we're always thinking about MVP, which is a minimum viable product. So you're just trying to do the minimum, right? And then you're trying to see what sticks and then change, 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 change. So it's all about as fast as you can go. And I'm like, and this is just for a, like a market research app. Like this isn't really that interesting, but I got to meet with like CMO at Delta and the CMO at Procter and Gamble. And I had these like really cool meetings and I'm getting to talk to these amazing people. And again, I'm like, how can I bring that mentality to the built environment? Like, how can I do that? And how can we innovate and change? And really we're already doing, there's a lot of innovation and change happening in our industry. We're just not talking about it. Like people don't know how to market it because again, typically and historically marketers have, have reached a certain level and then that's it. And they're typically seen as proposal developers. So you're not, you're not thinking, there are few firms thinking marketing as a strategic play. So that was kind of what I was hoping to bring to our firm. Yeah, I know. I'd say the the AEC industry in general is slow. I, I think I saw a graph once comparing the AEC to the tech industry. And I was like, oh, oh. okay, I get it. Yep. Okay. I get it. But, but again, so, the work that we do is so much cooler. Like, that, you know, what I, do I, I care about like, a, you know, an app on my phone that can change my face into a dog. Right. And like those people, they like sell their company for $10 million. I'm like, this is crazy. So anyways, it's just, I digress, but you know, it's again, you're like, how do we take a little bit of that and spice it up? Absolutely. Um, I wanted to switch kind of, maybe not switch gears, but talk about engineering talent since it's, it's something that over here, at least in the structural engineering industry, you know, we hear about uh, finding talent, finding ways to attract and retain new staff, providing them flexibility, uh, particularly about flexibility. What does that mean to you engineering wise and what are some of the things that uh, sheer structural has been doing that may that might be more innovative than the standard that you typically see well i think when you're talking about the standard in the aec industry the bar is typically pretty low <laughs> so there's like there's a lot of room for improvement so i i think part of the reason you know, part when we started sheer you know we were working out of my partner's basement and we didn't have any staff and we didn't have anybody that could do CAD or Revit. And so we had to be flexible from, we got literally got a project on our first day in business. And we were like, uh, we thought we were going to have like a couple of weeks to plan. And so we started growing so quickly. We literally flexibility was forced on us. So we're working out of a basement. We're having, we're like calling everybody we know. We get a contract worker. We have a stay at home mom that we knew that we had worked with like, you know, 10 years before who was at home and she was excited to do a little bit of work. And then we had somebody moonlight for us. So again, like just, we had to have flexibility from day one um, as part of the culture of our company, be just because our, I mean, the people that were helping us get the work done, were working either limited hours outside of work hours. And then again, you know, from me leaving the industry and working as a, in a tech startup for three years, I, I was so used to remote work and working when I could and, you know, kind of again, oh, this isn't working. Let's try it this way. So I think it just kind of started, you know, from day one, um, us kind of incorporating that flexibility, not just ourselves, but like with the people that we were working with and the people that we were hiring. Yeah. And it's interesting that you brought that up, especially with the tech startup. So a portion of my company is actually does a lot of software development and the mentality in the software space versus I work on the engineering side and the engineering space, it is like, like you can draw a hard line on like just the difference. Like they have like a foosball table, like they have like all of these different things. They work from home a lot. 
um, and they have like all these really cool setups, but it was very interesting to see because before I moved into this position, I, um, which my company is very flexible by, uh, United States engineering standards. Um, I remember it was like a, you are here at seven in the office and you leave at four 30 and I got to know where you are. And I, I, I have to know your marked time. You know, it was very like, I remember talking with my supervisor and the owner of the company because I came from a small uh, engineering firm um, in my first job. And I just remember it was like very structured. And then my second job when I was a field engineer in Houston was super flexible because you had to be out and about whenever, but also we worked from home. We didn't have like offices. So it's interesting that you brought that perspective, but it's also interesting, I think, to that y'all started out flexible just by necessity. Um, yeah. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. Like, you know, we weren't getting salaries. We had all contributed this money. And so we're like, how can we do it as cheap as possible? Obviously, like no office space is as cheap as possible. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's the cheapest software that I can get? I can't afford a server. So I'm going to use a cloud server because that's the cheapest. So again, a lot of those things just kind of drove us in that direction. And it was that, you know, easiest and lowest bought like lowest point of entry to you know set up the software this way and then it's like oh why, why doesn't everybody do it this way yeah and I think part of that is that change mentality because you know engineer I work with I've worked with them for a very long time they just like really dislike change <laughs> I could use a stronger word they hate change <laughs> but I'm gonna say they just really really dislike change so yeah this you know, is how we've always done it <laughs> we always work in the office <laughs> Yes. How could you not work in the office? <laughs> <laughs> and there are pros and cons to both. You know, I really think that flexibility starts with trust. And, you know, again, we bill our time so we can see very easily with metrics, like if employees are getting their work done and then we have deadlines. So again, it's like they're meeting deadlines. They're doing it to their time. Like, why don't we have that trust? And then we can be flexible on the schedule. Like some people just work better at night. When I was at the startup, uh, you know, the way that my team worked, they worked a lot like after 10 a.m. And I'm coming from an engineering firm where our office opened at 730. I was in the office at 730. And I'm like, nobody's working until 10. This is crazy. But I was like, well, it's kind of nice. I'll get up, go work out, have breakfast, enjoy myself. And like, so that's really great. And then I got, you know, used to working later at night, like at nine o'clock. And that's really a productive time for me. It's quiet. My emails aren't coming in. And now I'm a mom. And so I want to pick my son up from school, you know, so from four to six, I'm with him, you know, spending some time with him. I put him down to go to bed and then I can work again. And so that, you know, again, that's what works best for me. It doesn't have to work best for everybody, but it's like, you know, I think with employees, we just need to trust that they can get their work done. And, you know, especially it's like structural engineers typically have two degrees. So it's like, you have somebody highly educated person we should be able to trust them. So as long as the expectations are outlined, like, hey, I expect you to get this deadline done, or I expect you to work this many hours, I expect you to do this, then we need to, you know, trust them that they can get that done. And so, you know, you mentioned that it is a high trust environment. You know, I think, especially a lot of engineering firms have transitioned, especially with, you know, the pandemic, everyone was working from home. And then there was maybe like a hard push to kind of get people back into the office. And a lot of people really resisted that. Um, and, and maybe, you know, especially with your experience in the startup and starting from a more flexible standpoint, what are some of the challenges that you've faced with providing more flexibility? And, you know, what are the things that you've used to overcome it? I know for us, I'm, I'm in a flexible arrangement where I work three days in the office and two days at home. And like the goal was to essentially have all of our collaboration days in person when we could. And those are fall on my middle days of the week. Um, what challenges have you seen or do you have any uh, with the flexible arrangement? So I'd say, you know, in the pandemic, our challenge was our younger engineers really wanted more hands-on learning. And that was difficult to do that remotely, um, especially when the people that they're working with are a senior engineer who, who's just not used to the same level of technology. So, you know, that's a learning curve for sure. So we do encourage our younger staff to spend more time in the office. Um, so we have different levels of remote working based on the level of seniority of a staff member. And again, that goes back to trust, right? Like a person, we can 
you know, we should be able to trust a person a little bit more if they have a little bit more understanding of the job that they need to get done. Mm -hmm. um, but I really do think it's kind of employee specific. You know, you might have somebody who's a single parent and so they might need a little bit more flexibility or a little bit more, um, you know, just ability to do what they need to do because they're a single parent or, you know, they could be someone that's a caregiver to a, you know, to an older parent. So I just think it doesn't, I don't really think there's a one size fits all. And I think that is a challenge, right? I mean, we're a small company, you know, 13 people plus the remote worker, plus our contract and remote workers and everybody kind of works differently. And so it's just a challenge for a team where maybe that one team is like, Hey, we do a lot of our work in the office, but then you have one person on that team who's like, oh, I would rather be remote. So it requires constant communication Right. And I do really think that we, especially as managers and leaders, we need to like outline expectations. So if there's something that's not working, we need to shift that conversation, not to like, I need you in the office, but Hey, this is what I expect from you when you work from home, or this is what I expect from you when you're working at night. So I think we really need to talk about expectations rather than a one size fits all approach to flexibility. Yeah. And so with maintaining expectations, I think that also helps uh, workers per se with their work-life balance as well. When you, I know when I first transitioned to fully, you know, working from home during the pandemic, my work-life balance was worse. Like it was so bad because I, I would look at my computer setup and I'd be like, oh, but I have that one thing that I need to do. And it's next thing I know, it's like eight o'clock at night and I started work at, you know, seven and it, it really hurt my mental health doing that. And so at some point, I think it was probably maybe four or five months into the pandemic, I was like, all right, these are hard boundaries I have to set for myself. Um, and what I noticed is everyone was having, I think that struggle because I would get emails at like one o'clock in the morning. I wouldn't answer them because I don't do that, <laughs> but I'm like, what are you doing at one o'clock in the morning? You should go to sleep. Like, I know you have a wife and kid at home. <laughs> Maybe that's why you're working at one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I mean, really, I will say I do a lot of work late at night. It is a great for me. It's just like my, it is my absolute productive time. And then I can, when I'm at home, I can focus on my family. But what I have learned is we use Gmail. And so I schedule a lot of my emails. So like I might send it at midnight, but I, I know how that, especially to a younger staff member, I don't want the expectations <laughs> that, that like, Hey, you should always be responding to me. Like whenever I email you. So like I'll schedule it for eight o'clock in the morning and then it's done. It's off my plate out of my brain and it doesn't, you know, make it look too bad. Like I'm emailing people late at night. <laughs> yeah. And so with your younger engineers, you know, because you do offer this kind of flexible work arrangement and I'm sure they do have, maybe they've increased their work-life balance once they've found that happy medium, you know, what is some of the feedback you've gotten from employees about with providing them this flexibility and has it increased their quality of life? Have they determined it? So, uh, just in like a general, you know, there's the general morale of a company. Um, how has that gone? I mean, I think it's, you know, up, we've had challenges. I mean, I'm not going to lie. COVID was really hard culturally. You know, we did a lot of stuff together and then we had um, some employees with had health issues on top of during COVID. So then you want to be extra careful, right? You just want to make sure that you're, you know, not having a meeting in person with like everybody just to do something fun. So we had some virtual things that we did together and that's fun, but again, like just to a certain extent. So it's really been hard for us as we've, come back to the office or kind of come back to this new normal to really prioritize the culture and the relationships that we have. So we started when we um, started coming back to the office, we did uh, Monday lunches. So as a company, we provide Monday lunch to everybody and it, we encourage everybody to be at the office on Mondays and we go through scheduling and then we have lunch and we have lunch together. Um, sometimes we have lunch and learns in person. Sometimes it's just for us to get together and chat. Um, and so we've tried to kind of sprinkle in more things in person to just kind of build that relationship again. And then I do think, um, you know, with a younger engineer, sometimes our younger engineers don't know any different. So to them, like what we do is, is the normal. Um, and so, but I would, so I would say with our more senior engineers, you know, they, um, just seem to appreciate that we, again, trust them and offer these, um, 
unique options, especially, you know, we haven't talked about it much, but um, different employment types. So offering like part-time employment, maybe to somebody who used to be uh, full-time and they really just want to work 30 hours a week because they have a family. Um, so being open to having that conversation and, um, you know, or contract workers, we've had employees go from full-time to contract for various reasons. And we're like, Hey, you're a great employee. Of course. Like we want to work with you. You know, we don't want you to leave if you're unhappy or again, stay at home moms. I mean, we have some really great connections to some women um, and this would be open to any parents, but they, they have been in the past women um, who, you know, have children and their kids are now in school. So, you know, from nine to two, they're available and they're great engineers. And why shouldn't we utilize their um, experience and knowledge and the things that they have to offer? And like, especially for that, it has really helped us with overflow. So like when we get really busy, you know, we utilize this sort of, you know, Ex, you know, large resource pool that we have. Um, you know, we have somebody in Spain who's getting their master's degree and, you know, she works 20 to 25 hours a week for us and her hours, you know, she's ahead of us. So she gets all her stuff done. It's like done in the morning when we get there. It's awesome. So again, I think just being open to what works best for those employees and not just saying no, because it's something different. Um, so we're definitely like open to any suggestions. And again, we have people in other countries, contract workers, part-time workers, full-time workers, remote workers. So like just having a wide variety of people that we can use and call on when we need to is really great. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I feel when you were saying, I think that, yeah, one of the challenges of that is the, you have these different types of workers and getting everybody on board. Uh, I, I think I agree with the, definitely the younger engineers. I think that's challenging because I just remember when I was younger, I was asking so many questions to my manager that was, you know, right next to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I think with technology, you can do it, but it is slowed down. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's not impossible. I think we've proved that during the pandemic. It just might be not as efficient. Uh, same. I thing also with, just, yeah. yeah, I think it has to be intentional. So like during, during the pandemic, when we were all remote, um, every one of our supervisors or really project senior project managers, they had time on their calendar every day. That was just, they would just log in to Google meets. And so they were like, I'm just going to sit, I'm going to do work, but I'm going to be logged in. So if anybody has a question, they can just pop in. So like, and that was every day of the week. And so that was just a great opportunity. And probably, you know, like twice a week, a younger engineer would call on and like, Hey, can we do a screen share? You know, um, so just being intentional about how you collaborate and ask those questions, which again, can be harder because it's changed, it's different, but we kind of were forced to do that. Um, so now again, that we're sort of a hybrid, we're kind of relearning all those things again and like, okay, how do we do this? And, um, so, but again, I think over communicating and setting expectations and being intentional. But I think even now, specifically what you mentioned was having a set time, I, I have set, and some of my coworkers have set office hours mm -hmm. and it's literally for any topic and anyone can come and address something with us. And it's just like an open conversation of we have, you know, I have 45 minutes of time on Friday mornings, you know, come talk to me if you have questions and yeah. you're right. A lot of the younger, um, younger engineers, younger people in general really utilize that particular time because they understand they, it's almost like they feel anxiety to put specific time on your calendar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've had people tell me that, um, cause if you look at my calendar, it looks really intimidating and I don't have a whole lot of time, but when you do that block, it's almost like, it's like a relief, you know, for yes. them because they're like, yeah. Oh, you have this time specific. Yeah. And it's just it. like school, you know, professors have open door policies. So like, Hey, I'm always in my office this time. So it's very normal to them to have that. So, yes. you know, you can do that, but just be virtual. Yeah, and it's great that there's so much flexibility uh, that you're providing because uh, what do you, there's a, diff, you were saying that everyone's different and that's definitely uh, something that is challenging because everyone is different. Some people may have different circumstances, but when you were providing them with these different types of flexibility, you can get utilized talent that otherwise wouldn't uh, go used because of their circumstances. So why not have them work if if you if you trust them, they're going to get the work done. I think that's the biggest thing, having that trust and and as long as everyone's together and organized, uh, I 
I think that's one of the things that's definitely the, one of the pros, I would say for sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, talking about the other owners, companies, maybe industry wise, how do you think they can incorporate flexibility into their company vision and mission? I think first, like outside of vision and mission, it's got to be part of your culture. Um, you know, it's got to be something that uh, owner values. And I think that's probably the struggle right now is you have most owners are of a certain age and mentality that they just did not work the majority of their careers with a flexible work environment. And that is just a product of the way that it was. And, you know, not that it was bad. It's just the way that it was. And we're learning and we're being forced COVID and the pandemic forced us very quickly to accept this. So I would imagine that most owners have at least begrudgingly um, come to a point to know that they have to offer some level of flexibility. Um, So, you know, first it begins with your culture and it really first begins with you. So, you know, it's like, I don't want to be at the office working all the time. I want to see my family. So, you know, I make that a priority and I'm, I'm not like, shy about that. I mean, like my daycare still is running on COVID hours. So they close early. So everybody knows that I have to leave early to go pick up my son. But again, I'm available. I'm always like, okay, you know, I'm available one text me if something's urgent, and then I'm going to be on after eight o'clock. So if anybody needs anything, you know, just let me know. So again, it's that communication. So I would say owners just need to, you know, it needs to come from them. If it doesn't come from them, or it's really hard for them, which I do know some owners, it's really hard for um, things like closing the office for the Christmas holiday. So that's something that we started doing to we like close our office. So we're like, we literally like force people not to be in the office. This year, we're actually closing for two weeks just to like, again, like, so everybody is off of work and they have that time with their families. So kind of incorporating little moments or like, um, again, intentional moments of, of flexibility, I think is good. And then to bring it back to the vision and mission, um, you know, really, the thing that we sell as engineers is ourselves and our people. So if your employees aren't incorporated into your mission and vision, um, I would ask you to relook at your mission and vision because you can't do anything without employees and without engineers to actually do it. So part of our vision is to have fulfilled employees. So again, everybody's different. So fulfillment might look like something different to different people. We specifically chose that word because we want to have happy employees. We want to have fulfilled employees. And we do have employees that surprisingly like don't ever want to work from home. And that is totally fine. There is a place for them. Just like we have employees that never come into our office that live in Spain. And like that is how they are fulfilled. They are getting that work done. They are getting to work on unique and different projects while getting their degree. So I think, you know, to incorporate it into your mission and vision is to look at how your employee fits into that mission and vision. And so that's where I would start. Yeah. And that's, that's great. I, but I'm curious, you know, some engineering firms, you know, I've watched uh, cause I, I'm on LinkedIn and I remember watching it's a CEO of a very prominent engineering firm, like attending how to turn your engineering firm into a hybrid situation following, you know, the pandemic. And I was like, interesting. Cause it's an international firm. And I was like, it's interesting that he's thinking about that because beforehand they were a more uh, structured company. But I also know um, smaller firms that are very regimented. You know, I, I work in the South. I, you know, some of that old school mentality is still like tried and true. They want you to come in the office. The second they could, they could come into the office safely. They were like, all right, uh, you know, five days a week, seven to five, you know, that's what this is going to look like from now on. So if you have that situation where let's say a company isn't as flexible or is not adopting flexibility, are there things that an employee can do outside of just leaving? That's <laughs> all we, we've all heard about the great recession, you know, uh, <laughs> that it could, you know, kind of maybe sway a company to changing their mindset around flexibility or a hybrid situation. I mean, there are so many articles about the value of offering flexibility to employees that, and it's again, like as an owner, it's in my face. I talk about it in professional organizations. I see it on LinkedIn. I see it in the things that I get. So if an employer is still like, nope, this is the way it's going to be. That's okay. 
again, if that's if you're looking for a culture of flexibility, that is not the right place for you. So that is pretty much what an employee can do is leave. Or, you know, what you can do is you can say, hey, I'm considering leaving because this is what I want. But I, I like working here for X, Y, Z reason. And would you consider doing this for me? Like it's either I leave or I can stay, but like this. Um, that's a hard conversation to have, especially for a younger employee, but you know, not every job is meant for every person. We are not a company for every single person. You know, we are highly flexible, highly independent working. You know, we don't have a set career ladder when you do this, or you stay here for this long, you get to go here, you know, that's not us. And so not every employee is meant for that. Like some people need or want a lot of structure and that's not the kind of company that we are. So I think you just have to, to find that. So I would hope an employee in the interview process is understanding what that company is offering or what its flexibility look like to them. So I would, I would almost turn that and be like, when you're interviewing for a job, being sure to ask those questions, you know, Hey, what if I have a doctor's appointment, you know, pop up in the middle of the day, like, how do you guys handle that? And there are some companies are like, you gotta take PTO. And you know, I mean, to me, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> gonna take an hour and a half of PTO to go to a doctor's appointment. I mean, doctors are open you know, nine to five, like we work nine to five. So it's just, you know, again, if that, (laughs) if that, yeah, exactly. You know, it's just, so how do, you know, maybe asking those questions in the interview are are a good place to start. Yeah. And what I tell, uh, when I talk to my colleagues that are, you know, more into the management side of things, it's after the reset, after the, after COVID, especially if you're not going to offer some type of flexibility, other companies will. And yes, you're going to lose out on a big talent pool portion. Uh, now that people have become more aware that, you know, it's working from home. It's, it's, it's a, a lot more normalized now. And I think some of the stigma has uh, gone away from it. Um, so I think it's, that's kind of the world, world that we're going to be living in and, you know, companies have to adapt uh, how they adapt, uh, how, uh, whether they go all in or hybrid or not at all. I think uh, that's definitely something that, it's going to be ingrained or already ingrained in their cultures because, um, and I really like how you're doing it because it does start from the top. If the company, if the company leaders aren't doing it, then if someone lower tries to incorporate it, then they're going to feel bad because they're like taking advantage of something that's looked down upon. Uh, yeah. even though it's allowed, you know, so yeah. things like that. So I think starting from the top, absolutely. That's, I think that's how you, that's how you get it ingrained into the culture. It's ingrained in the leaders. Yeah. And you know, it's like that there's a business mantra, change or die. I mean, you have, if you want your company to be successful, you have to adapt and keep up with the times. And the pandemic showed our employees and owners and leaders and managers and supervisors that it's possible the work still got done. People still met their deadlines. So to go back to the way it was, no one's going to believe you. It's like, well, no, 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 no. We like get in. It's totally fine. And like, nothing's changed. So like we, you know, we can do this. So it was proved to everybody that it was possible. So there's no going back to that old, Hey, you got to only do your work in the office. No, it's going to be hard for those employer those employers to, you know, recruit in a yeah. crazy, crazy market. Yeah. And also with the topic of retention, that's also a big topic in the structural engineering industry, keeping employees. uh, I think the industry is kind of known for turnover and trying to, I think almost all the industries, but I, I, for me, I'm so close to it, the structural engineering industry, keeping that retention. uh, That's always a big topic. Uh, And retention, I'm sure, you know, as a business owner, how much it costs the company when someone leaves and then you got to do recruiting fees and then you got to make time for their interviews and then you got to train them and then they leave like <laughs> like all that time and so definitely you don't want people to leave um what's uh sheer structural's perspective on this and what are some things that uh, you have done to retain staff well again like i said employees are our product right we don't sell a product we sell services so employees are the thing that is the most absolute most important thing to us um so obviously retaining them is high on our minds you know we uh, like everybody else have not been immune to what i am now calling where i've seen it called the great realization so people are realizing the kinds of 
employment, uh, work, work, life balance. They, they realize what they want out of life basically and what they want out of their work. So, and again, like I said, we're not the company for everybody. So, you know, some of the things that we do to retain employees, I think um, it begins with transparency. We're a very, trans a very transparent company. Um, we send out monthly um, emails after our partner meeting where we share, do we meet billing goals? Do we meet collections goals? What's going on? What's the good? What's the bad? You know, we don't shy away from sharing that with, with our team. Um, we had a few people leave in like a very short amount of time. You know, I could explain them all individually. People moved away. Some people left the industry. Somebody just quit and stopped working, you know, but it still doesn't look good. And so we had all hands on meeting. Hey, let's all talk about, is there something that we need to address? Is there something that as owners we're missing? So we really try to include the employees and our team in the decisions that we make, because again, they're the most important thing. And without them, we can't do our work. Um, so I think just, again, being transparent and communicating is a great way to retain employees. Obviously, um, salaries has, have been a really big thing lately. And we've done, you know, we're not doing like a big company, like only one salary increase a year. You know, we'll give merit increases, cost of living increases. We'll just do salary adjustments when we review a salary study that came out. Like it doesn't have to be only once a year. It doesn't have to be twice a year. Um, you know, we did have a lot of people leave in a short amount of time. You know, we went ahead and just gave people bonuses because we're like, we know everybody until we find a new hire, we're going to, you're going to be working more. So like, we're going to help, like, we're going to do what we can and help you. Um, we are trying to schedule them for less work. So typically, you know, in our scheduling, we might look at scheduling a, a, a typical employee 40 hours a week. We're looking at scheduling them for 34 hours a week. So, because we know stuff comes up, so we don't want them to be overloaded. We don't want them to burn out. So we're thinking about that. Um, so again, I think they kind of approached at all levels and I'd say, I don't know if this counts as employee retention, but we spend a lot of time after somebody gives their notice with them. So, you know, either it's, Hey, we know you're leaving or you're moving. Um, is this a remote work scenario where when you move, maybe you're moving to the West coast, can we talk about working for us remotely? And, you know, sometimes it's like, they're like, no, I want to be in the office and I'm, you know, my my significant other is moving. So I'm going to be out there. Okay, great. Door is always open. <laughs> so we talk a lot about the door being open and we try to make someone's experience leaving our company just as good as it was when they came. And we have had people come back. So we're five years old and we've had people come back because they feel like, you know, we, once they turned in their notice, we didn't shun them. And I have, I have heard horror stories. And, you know, when I've left companies, I've been treated horribly. And like that is, you're like, okay, I'm never going to work there again. Like, why would I, I had a great experience. And then on the last day this happened and that was really terrible. So why would we do that to anybody? This is a very small world and our industry is even smaller. So we want to make anybody's exit experience as good as it can possibly be. And the door is always open for you to come back. And we have had people come back. So again, I think it's including our employees in many of the decisions that we make and being transparent and communicating and then making sure that they know that there's a place for them when they come back. Or we've also had people that are like, hey, you know, I feel burnt out. I'm working too much. And it's like, let's talk about part-time. Like, let's talk about what 20 hours a week looks like for you and what that looks like for us. And so I think some people just, they've never had that as an option. And we've hired people part-time who are like, that's what I told my you know, previous boss is like, Hey, I'm working too much. I still want to work with you, but I only want to work 20 hours. And they're like, we're not set up for that. And I want to be like, come, come here, come. We're set up for that. We have, <laughs> I have any kind of employee, like any kind, type of employee you want, like I got it. So like we have experience with it. We know how to work with it and just, you know, being available and flexible um, to what's the needs of the employee in that moment. Yeah. And I would even say that's a very thoughtful leadership style that like a lot of the the things that you mentioned is like trying to work with the employee as much as possible to make their work situation the best fit um, for both of you because it is and especially in a services oriented uh, company you know it, it really pays to listen to your employees and partner with them to make sure that their working life however it shakes out as best you know shakes out as best as possible and um, one thing you mentioned, and this is like such a hot topic because I think everyone is experiencing turnover is doing the bonus for the people who are being retained. Yes. 
or who are staying in the position. Cause I've, I'm, I mean, I've been in a situation where I worked on a team where we lost two team members and everyone had to pick up the slack and all of a sudden, you know, you're working went from working like 45 hours to like 60, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, and it's a really fast way to burn out. And then when someone gets hired on, if that work is not acknowledged, it's almost, it's almost like a slap in the face um, yeah. when that happens. So you mentioning that, that is, I think an incredibly good point to make, especially for a lot of companies who are having high turnover is to, you know, really look at the, the employees that you have who are picking up the slack and making the company still, the wheels still roll um, and acknowledge that. Um, Yeah, I think, and really, you know, some firms might not have the cash to be able to do bonuses. I understand, but it's really like what you said, it's the acknowledgement. Like an employee wants to be acknowledged that, Hey, I didn't leave. I'm staying. So like, can I just get a little bit of recognition that, you know, this is what I have to do now. And so again, I think it's just, appreciating the employee that you have because again without them you can't do anything so you know yeah. just at least you know acknowledge I mean I mean you're not gonna be able to give them a bonus every single time somebody leaves but we do like handwritten thank you cards you know when somebody does something good I mean I think a handwritten thank you card goes a long way so just <laughs> really a little does. thing just the little <laughs> things that we can do as leaders to appreciate the work especially right now I mean we are all so busy there are not enough engineers in our field and it takes them a very long time to get there so we will be in this for a very long time it will be a long it'll be years before we can kind of get back to normal without something major happening and i just think that even a recession won't affect us because we're just we've had a 10-year lack of investment in our industry and especially in the talent in our industry so we had low salary low wages low hiring for at post you know, 2008, and we are feeling those effects and it will take us a very long time to get back up. So we just, we need to appreciate our employees. Yeah. That's also a very interesting take on the industry in general. I haven't heard that, but yeah, I would say, I would agree with you is that, um, for a long time, structural engineers, and I, I mean, I've even had it where my younger cousins, they've looked at engineering, they're not going into engineering, but it was, and it was because of, they're like, well, it's a very conservative industry, even though you work in it, Kara, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like well, I can tell you that it's changing. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're going to a technical school and you're like, I could choose engineering or I can choose computer science when I graduate. I could get a job for $60,000 and work a ton of hours or I can get a job for a hundred thousand dollars, work from home, be flexible, have fun. You know, it's just like that. You're like, okay, that's, that's a big difference. You know, we're not talking about like $10,000 difference in salary. We're talking about major differences. And so tech companies have been investing there. And it's like, we as an industry need to invest there. We need to encourage kids who are like inclined to do engineering. I mean, they build Legos, they, you know, build sandcastles, like they love engineering and the things that we do. But then when you get to college and you look at the numbers, it's like, we need to make those numbers look better. And we're being, our industry, again, being forced into that direction because we have to, right? Like we have to have talent. So um, we're getting there, but it's still slow. This episode of the Structural Engineering Channel is brought to you by PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the PE Structural Exam. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the PE Structural Exam the first time. PPI's PE Structural course is fully updated and taught with October 2021 code references and includes new editions of their PE Structural books. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. When you take a live online course, PPI guarantees you will pass or you can take the on-demand course for free. PPI has helped engineers achieve their licensing goals since 1975. Check out PPI today at PPI, the number two, pass.com to see all of the resources available for PE structural exam prep. Again, that's PPI, the number two, P-A-S-S.com. And then, and you know, I hate to conclude our time because I mean, this was such a great conversation and it's such like, I know it's not a super hot topic, especially, well, I consider it a hot topic. I think it's so interesting. Um, But do you have any final advice to maybe young engineers 
wanting to join a flexible company or even, you know, maybe more tenured engineers who are trying to change the mind of the company they work for to a more flexible hybrid environment with, you know, some of the key benefits, the fast moving pace of a startup company. What final advice could you give? I would say the two parts, young engineers looking for, you know, a flexible situation, kind of what to keep an eye out for. And then for the more tenured engineers, how, you know, how do they maybe get their company to really listen to them on a hybrid situation? Um, for younger engineers, you know, my advice, and this kind of spans both flexibility and all things, is to just really increase your network. Um, you know, you will, if you increase your network in and outside the industry, you'll be aware of what other firms are doing when it comes to flexibility. You'll understand, hey, you know, actually the company that I'm at, this is pretty flexible, you know, maybe in my location or my region or for the job that I'm doing. Because again, like I mentioned, you know, our younger engineers, we do encourage them to be more in the office and have, you know, more kind of like sporadic flexibility. So, you know, maybe that's, and, and, and we explain to them why that is, right? Um, so, but having that network of other people that they can talk to where they're, you know, the other person's like, oh my gosh, we're, you know, we are, we're a button seat company. I have to be at the office at 7.30 every day and I can't leave until 5.30. So having that network will not only help you understand what else is out there, but it will also, even in our industry, always help you. I mean, like I would not be a business owner if I did not have the network that I have now. I mean, I would not have gotten a job in a startup when I had like zero technology and startup experience <laughs> had I not had my network. Um, so using your network and bolstering your network as early as you possibly can is a, just a great thing for your career. For a more tenured person in the industry, um, you know, if you have a connect, connection to your CEO or to the owner, I mean, that's when I think you need to be showing them that hybrid is here to stay, sharing those news articles, having them go to like, you know, an ACEC meeting or an a, like whatever name your professional organization here, you know, all these conversations are happening. Um, or even, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff in the industry. I also do things outside the industry. So I'm a part of a couple of entrepreneur groups and, you know, in those groups, you know, I'm the, typically the only person in the AEC engineering. And it's like, you hear from them and you're like, oh yeah, we, we, we still got some change to do. You know, you just hear what's, what they're dealing with and you're just like, oh yeah, we're like so far behind, but I'm like, but I'm, I'm ahead in our industry. So I'm feeling good. But you know, there's still, it's amazing. It's like, there's so many more things that we can do and so much more growth that we can see and so many innovative things that other companies are doing and they're doing the hard work, right? They're doing the, the trials and I'm like, okay, you figure that out and then you tell me and I'll do it and then it'll make it look, look, look really good. <laughs> so, you know, I do think kind of having those relationships or those tenured engineers encouraging their business owners to be looking outside the industry. And, you know, again, I, I would say this is where when you have owners that are all engineers that are working on billable work, it's very hard for them to take that step back and kind of see, you know, and for me, I can't do engineering work. I, I mean, I, sometimes I wish I could help and like go and rev it because, you know, people are working late on a deadline, but like, I have to be thinking about the business all the time. I mean, that's all I can do, you know? And so I do think there is value to maybe relying on those non-technical people and those non-engineers to be maybe helping, encouraging, finding those things or making that case. So a tenured engineer can maybe talk to HR or marketing. Hopefully those are not also engineers, um, but they can, you know, be talking to those people and be asking them to help them make that case too. So there are, there's a lot of um, good expertise in most engineering companies and we should be relying, again, relying on those people, relying on our team. Yeah, that's great advice. I especially like the the way you said about being open to the innovation that's happening in other industries. Cause that, yeah, I just feel that I think like what you were saying, most of the older uh, owners, I guess, for structural engineering firms are probably typically the technical ones. And, you know, they, they rose up to, to leadership and that's probably what they've been used to for X amount of years or, or whatnot, but having that outside, maybe even non-technical people that are looking at that and it takes time like you were saying trial and error but you're kind of learning from other industry professionals and seeing what works and I think bringing that th those types of innovations I've heard things about like you were saying flexibility but I've also been hearing things about 
uh, how different companies have different pay structures, how they pay their employees, maybe with uh, stocks or with some type of ownership instead of just salaried or, or bonuses. There's a lot of things because uh, my, my brother is in the tech industry and he's telling me how, how they do things too. And I'm like, oh yeah, why don't we don't do that. We should. I know. <laughs> there's, yeah. There's so many ways, but it, it does take but that. But like they've already done it. Like they did it like five, <laughs> ten years ago. I mean, look at remote work. Tech companies have been doing it for ten years, and we're like, oh, what are the issues? And it's like they've already figured all the issues. Just, just look at what they're doing. Copy that. You know, it's like again, we get so stuck into our industry ways. We got to take the blinders off, you know, and be like, what are other people doing? Like, and then what problems do they have? Right. I mean, all like, again, I go to the tech startup and I'm like, oh, these are the same problems that we had. Like these are the same marketing issues or company issues or business issues that we had, you know, it's just like, okay, but like what kind of, what now new tools do they have to solve them? Or how am I enabled as an employee to solve those problems? Like differently than I was previously. So it's like all these stuff are business challenges. All these business have these same challenges. It's just, yeah, they're, they're ahead of us. So just, just look at what they're doing. Copy it. Yep. Yep. And likely in the 10 years, they have likely found a solution yes. to all the problems <laughs> that they had. So <laughs> there's something out there. Yes, for sure. Um, well, thank you so much, Mallory. I think this is all that we have, but um, it was such a pleasure to talk to you and get your perspective on such an interesting topic that has been, well, I will say the engineering industry has been kind of forced into. And so <laughs> a very refreshing take, especially from a business owner on your flexibility and how it has really led your company to success. So thank you so much for your time and for sharing it with us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It was really fun. Thanks, Mallory. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We'd love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 81, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.